Okay, I think that's everything. Your audio should be on. So your audio is here. Okay. So if you wander too far away, they won't hear you. But your audio is here. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll make that small yeah. so that stays out of the way. Yeah. Okay. I'll do a quick introduction. We'll get started. In a moment. All right. And just a second. Uh, which, which way does it go? This, this which way does it go? Uh, this way. Oh, sorry. Let me. There you go. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. A few more people might trickle in. We got a minute or two. Yeah, I, yeah. I was no curious problem. to do a proper introduction no of Anil, and I printed his CV, and it's 33 pages long. Okay. We are we are very fortunate to have our own Dr. Anil Virkar here. You know, I'm not going to read all of this, but let me just point out a couple of things. Okay. He's been here since 1974. He started as a research assistant professor and worked his way all the way up the ranks through the tenure track. Actually, when I was here as a student in the 2000s, he was the chair of the department. Yeah. Um, he's since become a distinguished professor. In fact, he received an endowed chair, the H. Kent Bowen Endowed Chair of Material Science. He's done more things than I could list, but a couple of notable things is he's founded several companies, one of which I worked at, Ceramitech. I forget that you founded that. MSRI, where many of my peers worked at. Uh, his awards list is extensive. One of them stands out to me that you were the Mountain Man of the Year in 1995. <laughs> I'm curious about that one. Some major awards, though. It's not related to my height. <laughs> Uh, a couple of major awards. In 2006, he received the Utah Governor's Medal of Science and Technology. Big deal. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, which is another big deal. National Academy of Inventors. Like, these are pretty, pretty impressive. 250 plus talks, 40 patents, over 250 papers. What a pleasure to have you here and speak to us, Anil. Oh, thank it. you. Go ahead. That's okay. Actually, this talk is more for myself than for you in the sense, since COVID, I have not given a talk. And the last talk I gave at, was at University of Louisiana in first week in March, 2000. And since then I not talked. So I want to see if I can last one hour. <laughs> okay, all right. So the title of my talk, uh, my collaborator here is, this is what? Yeah, he does. Professor Xiaodong Zhao of University of Louisiana. And I had given, I'm essentially giving the same talk I gave two years ago. And it's a collaborator. So the title of my talk is Thermodynamic and kinetic consideration concerning stability and activity of core shell and alloy catalysts for proton exchange membrane filters. Long title, PMFC. Uh, proton exchange membrane filters is something like this. The polymeric membrane that conducts protons, this side is the anode, this side is the cathode. What you do is basically, and then there are catalysts on both sides. Basically, what you feed is hydrogen from this side, which dissociates into hydrogen gas into two hydrogens, then dissociates into a proton and an electron. Proton transports to the membrane. Electrons go in the external circuit to the load, doing work. And when here, oxygen splits into two oxygen atoms, acquires the two electrons, and reacts to form H H2O <laughs> protons. So basically, you're converting H2 to H2, and the electrical work is what you are getting. Is this doing okay? Yeah, I'm just going to mute it really quick in case our Zoom speaker is okay. All right, okay. All right, so this, let me just show you. Some, there's some commercial stacks pictures. This is a five cell stack, and that's what I'm showing here. And I think, yeah, if, if, know, yeah this has a, it shows an open circuit voltage of about five volts, one volt per cell. Okay. All right. There's, as you know, there's a lot of interest in EVs. Ultimately, really, the, the solution is not electric cars that we know now. Because what you have to do is you have to take gas, convert it, burn it, then run a turbine, then charge the, convert it to electricity, then charge the battery, and then use it. So if you look at natural gas to electricity, is pretty expensive. Right now it is cheap because only half a percent of world's cars are EV cars. If you get 90%, the gallon gas equivalent, it's called the, really in today's dollars will like $20 per gallon. So it's not cheap, it's cheap because not too many people are using it. So this is how the hydrogen car is envisioned. There's a hydrogen tank here. This is a fuel cell. That fuel cell, and there's a dc dc converter just to get a certain type of voltage, and then that is where the fuel cell runs and charges this battery and the battery is the one that drives it, basically. So it's a small battery. 
and chances of fire are very low in hydrogen fuel cells. But people don't know is that if, if, if there's hydrogen in this room, we cannot light a match. But hydrogen coming out of this cylinder goes off so fast that it doesn't have time to mix because it's so light. And then a lot of work in Norway in that. And a good friend of mine at the University of Norway actually has one of these. What is the problem right now? The problem is we don't have hydrogen infrastructure. We can go on for it. The other thing to also realize is that when people think of EV batteries, minimum charging time is 20 minutes. Can you imagine having thousands and hundreds of thousands of charging stations everywhere? It's just not realistic. Okay. okay. So what is one of the calculus? Both sides had uh, anode and cathode is platinum. Platinum is expensive, so you don't want it to do, and platinum degrades. So that's the problem. One main issue is loss of activity and degradation of cathode catalyst. Okay, so this is my outline. What are the mechanisms of catalyst degradation? Role of thermodynamics on durability, alloy and core shell catalyst, role of cat uh, catalyst, distribution, uh, catalyst size distribution, role of support, increased stability in role of support. Catalyst has to sit on something. So, right. By the way, I had way too many slides. I might skip some, and there are a lot of equations, but unfortunately, <laughs> there's not much I can do about that. Okay, so, so the catalyst is, it sits on a carbon black, and these are platinum catalyst particles. So how do they degrade? Sometimes this platinum catalyst just detach from the support. If they're isolated, they cannot function as catalyst. The other thing that can happen is, uh, um, Okay. Oswald Ryman. I'm sure many of you are taking 5034 or 6034 right now. Are anybody taking? Right. Okay. So, Dr. Zhang's class. Oswald Ryman is one. Smaller particle design, deposit on bigger. As they get bigger, there's loss of activity. Okay. The other thing that can happen is this, if they get in direct contact with each other, they just like sintering. Okay. So I'm going to talk over thing. Again, you're doing uh, thermodynamics in last semester. So let's look at what is the chemical potential of platinum would be. This is for a particle of radius R. This is mu zero PT of standard platinum, bulk platinum. That's plus two times the surface energy, molar volume divided by the radius. So smaller the particle, larger the chemical potential. Larger the chemical potential, more the chances are for degrade. We want small particles for a good catalyst, but then they degrade as well. And this is, as you know, called the Gibbs Thompson or Kelvin Thompson equation. Okay, I'm going to put some numbers here. If you look at any thermodynamic data tables, you will find that at room temperature, the chemical potential on the molar basis is about minus 147 joules per mole. Okay, that's the number. That's about a nano size particle of particle radius R. And we'll take that one one nanometer size. And if you took 1.5 joules per meter square, then it's minus 120. Remember, minus 120 is plus 27 joules kilojoule per more, more than the flat. So that's why it's unstable. Okay, let's consider that there are two platinum particles that are sitting in a solution. And so what's going to happen? This is the equation we just saw. So smaller particles want to dissolve and deposit on larger particles. Now what can happen is platinum ions can go from here to here, but there is no path for electrons if it's in water. So what happens is this becomes positively charged, this becomes negatively charged, and it gets harder and harder for platinum to move. So what in electrochemistry we will say, when the chemical put the electrochemical potential ions, which takes into account electrostatic potential, of those the particles become equal, there's not going to be any further more particle go. So what do we need? We need some way to transport electrons. So now I think about how we can calculate the record. Here's a carbon support. Here's platinum, small platinum, and the larger platinum. What can happen? That platinum dissociates into platinum 2 plus 2 electrons. Platinum 2 plus go through here. Two electrons go through here. And then they come recombine. So that's where you transport platinum from one place to another place. And direct contact, of course, similarly, same thing will happen. So now here's the thing. Support must be electrically conducting, because otherwise it's not going to function as a catalyst. 
but if it is conducting then you're going to degrade it also so there's a certain kind of, so i'm going to i'm going to so here's a slide here's a company called e-tech platinum catalyst as we see it has kept one week in nitric acid and you can see slight growth of that and this is iron azure high resolution tm and then i was kept in one week in a platinum tetrachloride solution now when it says platinum tetrachloride it has small amount of platinum two plus so the actual reaction occurs with two plus and not four plus even though the solution and you can see in one week it really become boulders pretty large okay so again i'm going to show you this eh? same slide as this thing eh? so what does this mean if i were to put it in a support that is not electrically conducting nothing should happen and that is here's an uh, TA micrographs of platinum aluminum oxide one week later and there's no growth in fact there's not really no growth because you're sitting there some of the platinum dissolves into platinum chloride so actually the amount of platinum is less than here it just dissolved because of this reaction okay all right so what is the role of thermodynamics in kinetics and degradation of durability dissolution of platinum and precipitation Platinum ion concentration dictates the kinetics of transport. If there's a lot of platinum 2 plus, yeah. Chemical potential of catalyst in the cactus determines PT2 plus can. I'm sure you're probably looking at the 50 34 class growth of particles. So, what happens is a smaller particle has a more concentration dissolved in it, even in metal and all that, and that's where they transport the skin. Oxidizing atmosphere, higher PT2 plus concentration, cathode. That's where degradation occurs, cathode and not at anywhere. Okay, platinum is expensive. So, what people have done over the years is alloy it with something so that it, it, you can bring the cost down. Most common element added is cobalt. So, role, what is the role of, we're going to look at the role of thermodynamics, alloying, chemical potential of platinum, role of alloying elements in degradation, in involving dissolution and reprecipitation. I retain a number of people, so many of these people have done extensive work on these alloy catalysts. Okay, we're going to see alloy catalysts here. What can happen first? The smaller particles and larger particles. Cobalt can dissolve from both of places. So initially, cobalt keeps on dissolving. But in addition, platinum keeps on transferring from here to here. So what happens is there's an in situ core shell catalyst formation. So larger particles get some platinum. And smaller particles do some part. Now, imagine here, if it goes to this stage, the chemical potential here of platinum goes up because there's a pure platinum on the surface. Chemical potential here goes up because it's become smaller in size. So eventually you can come to a situation where this chemical potential can actually become equal. So here I have chemical potential of a particle, this particle, a smaller particle. So the thermodynamic activity of platinum in the alloy and so therefore this rt l and at term there and this surface energy term larger particle there is a standard set chemical potential 2 gamma vm over r1 now in this case we're going to there is no rt activity a term because this is one the surface has pure platinum so eventually you can come to a situation that these two become equal and that kind of gives you a sort of a situation where more stability is occurred due to alloying element okay that's kind of tend to be equal but what that all depends upon the activity of platinum into the alloy so that is determined by concentration of platinum multiplied with the activity coefficient and again from thermodynamics you know that activity coefficient is related to partial molar enthalpy of platinum the alloy of dissolving that okay. all right so I'm going to show you the commonly used platinum cobalt alloy. If you look at PT cobalt system, really this is not a very good system. Why, why not? See, PTCO form a solute solution over the wide temperature range. There are no compounds. If there are no compounds, activity just doesn't go down much. Activity just doesn't go down. So if how many of you know regular solution? Regular solution? Study in thermodynamics? No? They're just being shy. You've seen I mean, I'm not going to ask any question beyond that. <laughs> if you assume a regular solution and they get give some uh, so-called so interaction parameter, that gives an activity 
coefficient of 0.98. So the activity is only 0.74. So what happens using platinum comma, you go to stability because of the reason I told you, but really it's not that good. So what did, <laughs> okay. So what that winds up doing is, oh, here I'm missing something. Yeah. Because of the, yeah. Okay, that's okay. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it comes, it only takes minus 141 or something. So it doesn't go down as well. And or only goes to 120. It's not really as good. So let's see what can technically we do. Well, let's take a platinum aluminum system. If I take a platinum aluminum system, there are so many intermetallic compounds. That's the good news. But bad news is aluminum easily oxidizes. So how are we going to make platinum aluminum alloy and not have to do that? So this needs to be studied, but hasn't been studied. Okay. So I'm going to talk about purposely made core shell catalysts. This happened like core and shell by in situ. So I'm going to say, what do we want in core shell? We want epitaxially matched platinum shell over some element so that it gets by ex by actual stress in the shell most important thing i think is, is there's a very well known people always used to assume that strain energy is equal to chemical potential actually that's not true because chemical potential integral vdp so is the pressure so if pressure is negative the chemical potential goes down and there is a very well-known paper by a person called E. F. Flood in the Canadian Journal of Chemistry, which is a very fantastic paper back in the 1950s, who pointed that out. So, so what do we want? We want preferred cores are both with large, larger lattice parameter than platinum, silver, gold, and possibly alloys of silver. Possibly aluminum, but as I said, aluminum does oxalate is a major problem okay i'll spend some time on this one what i'm showing you here here's a silver core and here's a platinum shell silver and platinum both are fcc so there is a way you can imagine that lattice planes are continuous so supposing these are one 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 plane that continues through that now what happens is platinum has a Silver has a larger lattice parameter. So on a silver core, if platinum deposits, platinum is put in tension. And it's by action, spherical. So it, is there's a stress that goes like this, like, that I'm showing you here, by actual stress, like this. And, oh, sorry, yeah, by actual stress in it. This is a compression on silver, but on platinum with its tension. So the chemical potential now becomes mu zero, that's for the standard set, uh, pattern 2 gamma pt over r minus 2 sigma theta theta over 3 sigma theta theta is the tension supposing if you take a body and put pull this way pull this way pull this way pull this way and pull three direction the pressure is given by all these three stresses some of them divided by three here we don't have stress that is goes perpendicular so we have what we call only two of those. That's the reason we have term that says two sigma theta theta by three. So the because of tension, the pressure in the platinum shell is actually low. What does that doing? What does that do? The if you look at the particle size uh, lattice parameters of platinum and silver, the amount of stress can you can imagine is almost four gigapascals, which is very high stress. If that happens, the chemical potential it changes by minus 24 kilojoules per mole. So this is the chemical potential for pure platinum. This is the chemical potential related to this surface energy term. And this is the chemical potential related to the stress that's created. What does that wind up doing? that changes the chemical potential to minus 144.67. See, almost close to the bulk platinum now. So we almost got on the rid of effect of the particle size. So what does it mean? Decreased potential and this is therefore increased durability. 
Breath. Take a little break. <laughs> so what we did is we defined stability here in terms of volts. And the volts would mean pressure, which is that I just not told you what that is, divided multiplied by molar volume, divided by 2F multiplied by negative sign. Okay. That's how we define the stability in terms of voltage. So there is a paper by uh, Ramirez Calabra and uh, this name gone, but Parla Bulea from the University of Texas AM. She is very well known in density functional theory. She said a lot of work on stability of platinum catalyst. So, what she considered is element as a coarser catalyst. If it's just platinum, there's no change. So, uh, basically, DFT shows there's no change because uh, Platinum, platinum is no any volume. Now, if you take silver, their calculations show that the stability is increased by 200 millivolts. As I said, it is given in terms of volts. For gold, it is 160 volts. For copper, it is minus 8.4. For nickel, minus 600. Now, this is from density functional theory. Okay, and what we have done is just use thermodynamics and lattice parameters. So the calculated value for silver is plus 190. Not too bad from the density functional theory calculation. For gold, plus 180, 160, not too bad. Copper, there's a big difference. So we have to find out when not. Nobody has tested, it's just tough to know. Nickel gives you minus 520 and minus 600. That means you cannot use nickel as a core. If you use nickel as a core, Stability will be very poor. It will just quickly dissolve over. So we we did some work actually on uh, doing synthesis of silver uh, uh, particles with platinum and iron, and it, that is easy to do because all you have to do is a displacement reaction. So you take nano-sized particles of silver that are supported on um, graphite, carbon particles, put it, I think, a few hours in a platinum tetrachloride solution. So here I'm showing silver atoms. The reaction, however, is two silver atoms reacting with platinum 2 plus from the solution, giving platinum and two silver ions. So you have to dissolve two silver atoms to put one, basically. And that's the reason I have, what I've shown you here is you have to, that's the reason I've shown smaller core. That's starting because you have to dissolve more. So, so let's see how that works. What I'm showing you here is after this thing is done, this is a high resolution TEM image. And so this, what you're saying, this is carbon. What you're showing here is a central silver particle. And this is platinum. And therefore, to do to verify for that, in fact, it is what, what, what we did is did chemical analysis on using EDAX on his TEM. Major composition here, it's obtained spectra from here and obtained spectra from here. If you look at particle like this, when the beam goes through the particle, you're going to see some platinum, but you're going to mostly see silver. And if you go on the edge, you will go see silver and a little bit of platinum. So if you see, this is the one that's the shell area. Okay, you can see platinum signal is not a silver signal is small. But you have to only compare the relative comparison here, not here and here. So if you now look at this one, which is going through the core area, sorry, this core area, the silver signal is proportionately higher. Of course, platinum is, is bigger intensity. So so we were actually able to do this, and then we unfortunately I put this forgot to put the slide in here. Then we made and did PEM studies, basically using commercial platinum catalyst as well as the one we did with platinum and silver. Is it? And the it was perfectly compatible. And this I sort of forgot to print that slide. Okay, so let's start. We're going to now talk about practical size distribution. Um, 
average size we want to be 2 to 10 nanometers. Most catalysts are we call polydispose, I mean the, the particle size distribution, there's not just one mono distribution. Smaller particles shrink, larger particles grow, as we said with the induction. Driving force between two particles is proportional to differences in their chemical potential. So smaller particle has, okay. so they are inverse like a radius. And we're going to talk about the stability of mono dispersed catalysts. Okay. okay. What I'm showing here is let's look at the effect of platinum size distribution. Smaller particles, larger particles. There is some average concentration in the liquid that's related to average particle size. And this model is generally used in many things, electrostatics, other field, called mean field model. Basically means that we cannot talk about atoms going from one particle to other particle. It's like atoms going from smaller particles into the solution and from the solution deposited in larger particles. So this is the average concentration in the solution, which is determined by the average particle size. This is smaller than average. So as a result, the concentration is higher here. This is larger than average. So concentration is smaller here. So what happens? Here deposition happens, here dissolution happens. And by doing this, particle size center go. So here I'm showing the particle size distribution, number of particles between say R and DR. And this is the particle size distribution. This is the average particle size. This is the case where the particles are very close in size. So what winds up happening is a narrow distribution. So what we did is I said, let's calculate the chemical potential as a function of number of particles in a particle. So what I'm showing you here is logarithm of the difference in the chemical potential of two particles based on the number of atoms that are there in it. So let's see if I can read it here. Okay. The total number we chose for calculation is 642 atoms. Okay. So the closest is uh, uh, 321, 321. You see what I'm saying? If they're 321, if 321, 321, there is no difference in chemical potential. So I cannot plot it on this one. So this one is one contains 322 and the other contains 320. So that is the chemical potential given is normalized. So I won't go into details of that. It's like minus one to 10 to the power of minus four. But if I had the same particles and here the difference was, let me just read it here. One atom is, one particle is 5.28 and one is 4.2 nanometers. Can you see the huge difference in chemical? This is a logarithmic scale. And of course, we, we, we can go, okay? if I go to this one, then we go to infinity again. So it's not. So you just show there is an orders of magnitude difference in the difference in chemical potential and therefore the driving force for the growth of the particles. Okay. It is just given, it is the same equation as I said before, so difference in chemical potential, 4 gamma, this is the radius, 2 gamma R type, remember that, that term, and in essence gives you particle size in terms of number of particles, difference, and that's the difference. And here is, as I said, NC1 and NC2 are 642, radius of particles, if they are identical, we will be equal to this, and if they are identical, there is not going to be any growth. So what do we want? We want to have not only really catalyst but it should be as mono dispersed as is possible. They don't want poly dispersed. Okay. So again, same thing I'm plotting here. In this case, number of particles 642 and delta plotted as a function of difference in particles. And you can see if there is only difference of two, is the same plot but then you different. Okay. Yeah, this is as depending on total number of particles. In this one, the total number of particles are only 10. Okay, and so, how they can, so you can see that this relationship holds down to very, very low number of atoms. Okay, okay so there is a lot of work done in trying to make particles of different things that are as mono dispersed as is possible. So, here is some from Germany, this some work, 
and I won't go into the details of that experimental procedure. So they were looking at resistance to sintering of platinum particles as a function of how many atoms are there in a particle. So this one, mono dispersed, has all particles have 68 atoms. All have 68 atoms. And this is done through certain procedure where the atoms are diffracted through electric field and they can actually control how many atoms are there. So the mono dispersed after so many times with 68 atoms go because of the same reason as I was telling you, because they have chemical potential differences different. In polydispose that contain 22 atoms and 68 degraded very fast because now atoms are going from the 22 atoms to the 68 atoms and the particles keep on going. And this one again is number of atoms is 53 and up. These have on some atom particles that are like 200, 300, 500 atoms. And they go much faster than 68. And some people have done work about gold at room temperature, gold atoms on carbon, they went for 3000 hours <laughs> at room temperature without changing. While polydispersed were done within, a, within a two days at room temperature. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about briefly about the role of support. You have to take this platinum and put it on the surface somewhere, with, like I said, graphite. Interaction between catalyst and support, functionalization, weighting. I'm sure you have studied contact angle and heterogeneous nucleation, for example. And we could also talk about support surface geometry. No support is exactly flat, it can be like this, right? So what would the effect be? Okay. We have, I'm going to say functionalized support, catalyst weighting support against one nanometer particle. Chemical potential difference between bulk platinum and particle of radius one nanometer is two gamma platinum surface energy R0 molar value. And as you said, the same number I had shown before is minus 120 kilojoules per mole. That's it. So this difference, I'm going to write in terms of the volume of platinum, volume of this particle, rather than in terms of radius. Now if you take this particle, put it on support, now it spreads and becomes this. So now, here, chemical potential is given by this term here, and the active catalyst surface area is this, which is what we need for the electrical catalysis to occur. Now we're going to put this one and put it as a lenticular shape, as a distance. Now, what we're doing is we're taking the same particle and just spreading it. So the volume is fixed, it's not the same volume. But now if we this thing, now we have to see what is the chemical potential. Now, because we had then spread it like this, the radius has increased. And so the chemical potential now can be given in terms of this and this contact angle formula, you've probably seen it before, okay? in your contact angle cell. But this is the chemical potential difference now if it is a contact angle is theta. Okay. So what we're going to look at is this was the one that we had seen before, right? Uh, uh, bulk platinum at particle of radius R0, all right? So we're going to now take a ratio of this, delta mu t, if it is sits on a support and a contact angle is theta, then this is the relationship that you get. This is a relative chemical potential if you spread like that. And for area, we have to have catalysis to occur. And the catalysis is going to occur on this surface. Nothing is going to happen here. So one can now go ahead and take the ratio of this surface area by divided by this surface area. So what we have to see, do we get any advantage in stability? Do we get any advantage in activity? Okay, both those. For theta equal to 30 degrees, this ratio is 0.234. So we had decreased the chemical potential by what? 76% decreased the chemical potential. And the area, 1.22, so we have been able to increase the stability and increase in catalytic activity. So it's a win-win situation if we to do this. 
And so what, what I plotted here as a function of theta, this uh, shows the ratio of that one, uh, this, uh, of this lenticular particle divided by a spherical particle. And, the, and this shows the durability, chemical potential of this thing, okay, difference. So what we observe that if you go from contact angle zero, just flat for first, then it has activity, the activity goes to infinity, infinity doesn't go because the lowest you can have is mono layer of platinum on the surface. So you get high enhanced activity and enhanced durability. There is a certain minimum that goes to, and here if you go 180 degrees, 180 degrees means there is no weighting at all. So it's just like this. So that's a little bit. So what do we see? As the contact angle decreases, the chemical potential decreases, we get increased stability. As the contact angle decreases below 40, surface area increases, increase activity. When the contact angle is zero, complete weighting, the chemical potential corresponds to the bulk platinum, just flat. Very large area modular, that means will happen with that. And actually, some work from Professor Zard University of Louisiana actually showed a very interesting thing. They put platinum or titanium disulfide and platinum carbon. This ECSA is called electrochemical surface area. This is done by so called stripping of carbon monoxide and things. So it's done in a different way. So this is, he observed that if you put platinum and titanium disulfide, the activity remains for a longer time and remains at a higher level than on carbon. Now, why would that be? There are a number of reasons why. Of course, it, oh, sorry, I forgot it. So this just shows platinum, titanium, bisulfide, platinum, and carbon. You can say both have area has increased, the particles has increased, but there's less on this one. That's you can easily from this one. Why would that be the case? Oh, one other interesting thing is that platinum, let's look at platinum titanium phase diagram. There are so many intermetallic compounds, which means there is negative enthalpy of interaction. So basically, platinum likes to stick on such a surface. That's the reason they, they use platinum titanium phase diagram. That's exactly the case with platinum silicon phase diagram. There are many platinum silicides that can form. But platinum and carbon don't form anything, much of anything. So it's a physical bonding to just say. Now, again, I mean, just a few more slides, so I think there will be some time. I, will, I wanted to finish as fast as I could. Support geometry and connect. Now, if this particle, and this is a contact angle theta, had been put here, it would have been like this. But same thing, if you put in here, it will look like this, depending upon what this angle alpha is. By the way, this is some famous work done, or not on this one, but similar thing. But there are a very well known, I don't know, you probably know, David Turnbull. Harvard. Harvard, that's what <laughs> David Turnbull and Hardwell did in the 30s and 40s, a lot of phenomenal work. So now we, what we can see, now we can have a situation where the curvature could be actually negative. You see what I'm saying? If it is negative, that means there is a negative pressure. If you like this, a positive pressure. It's negative pressure if it is like this. So now you can actually calculate what the relative chemical potential are like this and what the relative areas are. And one gets a very fascinating result. This is the ratio, chemical potential, uh, this is the activity ratio that I've shown you here, how it varies as a function of contact angle. And this is showing the uh, chemical potential, the durability of it. Depending on what this. So we have to So for if I were to choose alpha is equal to 45 and theta is equal to 10, all right? So nice. Then the chemical potential is minus 157 kilojoules per mole. For bulk platinum, is one minus 147. That means you want catalyst distributed in such a way that it sits into the crevices. If it sits into the crevices, it is even better than. Flats, okay. So, I mean, this slide that I'm comparing it with bulk platinum at 300 is minus 147 kilojoules per mole. 
one nanometer particle is minus 120. One nanometer PT3CO is minus 190. So you, thermodynamically, you don't get much, get much at all compared to nanometer. One nanometer silver particle is minus 144. Excellent. So we want minus, we want something of that type. A lenticular particle equivalent to the shape, shape like this, I mean, is minus 141. And for a particle in a crevice, alpha is equal to uh, 45 and theta equal to 10, is minus 157. So it's extremely stable. So what may be the best way to do it? Best way to do it possibly is take a support, first deposit little silver, then deposit platinum. So you can get this is our, you can get even improvement over this. You might, we're not then I probably, can easily calculation can be made. So, so let me summarize, okay. Lower platinum chemical potential, higher stability. Alloy catalysts are, and, and interpretary carbons are more stable. Core shell, the shell is in tension, so you want to have uh, silver in the core. You like to have mono dispersed catalysts, so the Hardly any different, there's no driving force for particles to grow. Catalyst weighting supports stronger interactions, increased stability, I think. Thin platinum in support of crevices should be stable. And silver core and platinum in crevices may be even better. Also. So, I think that was my last slide. So, thank you. start with the math and then do the experiments after or do you pick the equations up as a matter of looking up other no uh, first we do the math okay math comes first and then the experiments right. okay yeah right first and for example this cravish support that i just showed you we have not done that experience yet ah, basically we have not done that but i'm going to release one very important I mean, I'm going to ask you, pose a question and ask you a following question. Okay? Think how counterintuitive it is. We're going to take two platinum wires, okay? Take a solution in beaker of platinum chloride. One wire is just, just study there. I'll take a rod. So, and the other wire, we're going to put it over pulley and put a weight on it. So this wire is in tension, right? And then we're going to electrically connect the wires. So allow electrons to flow. Intuitive feeling is the wire that is being pulled will shrink. The wire is pulled bigger, fatter, because the chemical potential is lower. And so, one of the students had done that. We had done the experiment because we knew this should be so. What we did that, and she was able to show that after the the diameter of the platinum wire that was under tension grew from about 127 microns to about 135 microns. Wait, you said it grew? Okay. If you take two wires. Yeah. But it didn't shrink? The one that is in tension grows. Because one that is tension has negative pressure. So the chemical potential is lower. It's counterintuitive. Yeah. And so the point is, there's a lot of literature that uses strain energy. That's incorrect. And that's what the EA floor shows. Because strain energy is sigma square which is same for positive tension and compression but pressure is different and so that paper by ea flood is only theoretical paper that uh, and it's very difficult to follow <laughs> but there he nicely shows as to how is there are many experiments done in the 30s and 40s and they did not know what they want to make they always or think something is wrong because they are looking at strain energy. And today, if you see in journals like many physics journals, they routinely use strain energy. But that's not correct. If you take the actual film, you have to take the pressure, and that's a more dominant term. Strain energy weak term. Yeah. What is a good activity for the Sorry, I missed it. What is a good activity? Uh, 
It says that activity is too high sometimes. No, activity is not too high. No. Okay. Uh, the stability is poor. You, you want as high activity as possible. As high, because you want to, firstly, you want high activity and high stability. Now, the current wants that, say, for example, Toyota makes Mirai. Unfortunately, there is no hydrogen infrastructure. If I were living in California, I would get one. There is no infrastructure here. Japan, there's a lot of that. So the, 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 the stack, they, their goal is to have lasted for at least 5,000 hours. That comes to driving time, basically. basically. And then, then it's practical, basically. And they, they have, of course, you know, it's the same thing. If you look at literature, you'll see a lot of work on lithium ion battery, but you're not going to never know what Samsung is doing. Same thing here. Even though there's a lot of literature, some of these companies obviously we are ahead. They, yes, they patented work. Yeah, mostly. So, I have a question for yeah. you. With this platinum in the crevices of yeah. the contact angle and the wettability completely depends on the substrate. Are there yeah. candidate substrates that would fit this sort of 45 degree angle, 10 degree yeah, angle yeah. you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What substrates would you use? I mean, some of these silly sites that you have to experimentally measure it. You have to have some kind of an interaction. You see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. So silicides? Uh, yeah, silicides would be good. Um, um, titanium based alloy. Many of the ones that platinum forms compounds with, uh -huh. ideal. So, so that was the reason that they use titanium disulfide exactly for that reason. Right. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? You'll have a chance to ask him more questions in two weeks or three weeks on April. Three, yeah. guys, he'll be back with another talk. So let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Huh? I hadn't seen this part before. Huh? I'd seen, I'd seen one about three or four, but I hadn't seen this stuff. This was really interesting to see. Yeah, Suppose, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's not really for me. That's the one that the Shadow and John myself were doing. Yeah, 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 really cool. Yeah. So, what do you ever run into instances like with silver, platinum, and silver where it's not epitaxial and then you lose all the strain engineering? But then, yeah, then, yeah. It has to be epitaxial. How do you know if it's epitaxial? Do you see okay. it with microscopy? Oh, yeah. How do you see it? Those are actual, the lattice plants are contiguous. Oh, okay. okay. They are contiguous. Yeah. Sorry, I, just, I may have missed it in your uh, talk, but. The platinum is being used as a catalyst yeah. in these fuel cells, right? right? Yeah. So, 